Welcome to Heresy, the Horus Heresy talk show. In this video, we're going to be talking about Leviathan Dreadnought, how to equip them, how to use them, and also how to beat them. We're going to be going through their weapon options, optimal loadouts with those weapon options, the battlefield roles that Leviathan Dreadnoughts can play for you, what their strengths and their weaknesses are, and then also how to beat a Leviathan Dreadnought. But before we do that, if you enjoy the content, please do like and subscribe. And if you've got any comments or feedback at all, please leave them down below on YouTube. And now on with the show. I'm going to assume that you know the basics of the Leviathan Dreadnought, what its stats do and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to jump into the weapon options for the Leviathan Dreadnought. Firstly, and probably most commonly taken is the Siege Claw. So it's a strength 10 weapon, which means it's going to instant death even tougher targets that sometimes get to toughness 5. And it wounds enemy dreadnoughts on a 2 plus in combat. It's also reasonable at knocking some chunks out of vehicles if you end up in melee with them. Mostly it means that this dreadnought with its weapon skill 5 and its 4 or 5 attacks on its stat line has got something meaty to hit things with in melee. There's also the siege drill. So it loses the brutal from the siege claw, which in return gives it armor bane, which also goes up to strength 12, which means that it's like super good at killing vehicles you basically auto penetrate or almost auto penetrate anything in the game easily worth five points to upgrade your dreadnought with one of these if you've also got a siege claw in the other hand and you go and double melee and you want to get five attacks because you will still use the siege claw with its brutal on most things but this also means that you've got the option of killing vehicles as well and that's a pretty cheap upgrade for five points although you probably could skip it if you really needed five points in your list Remember that both of these do come with a melter gun as well, which although very short range, is certainly nothing to be sniffed at. Onto the guns, we've got the Cyclonic Melter Lance. So this is a 20 point upgrade, the most expensive gun you can put on a Leviathan. It gives you four melter shots at range 18. So longer than your average melter gun, but not particularly long ranged. It will annihilate most armored targets and do heavy damage to enemy dreadnoughts if you get within nine. It's a lot of shots, ballistic skill five, very consistent. You can easily put three damage on an enemy dreadnought, which will you know take half its wounds off, or you probably just multiple penetrate even something like a Spartan, or at least a good chance of getting one. It's also reasonable at cutting through elite marines like Terminators. So again, ballistic skill five, multiple shots, AP one, instant death as well. They're only going to get their invulnerable save. You can easily take out a good hundred or more points worth of Terminators or something with this too. Then we've got the Leviathan Storm Cannon. Now, this is great for tearing up armor via glances. Sunder and Rendon 5 is a very consistent uh, armor penetration dice roll. So you will penetrate things quite a lot as well. Now, it's only AP4, so you'll mostly be damaging weapons or immobilizing things rather than actually blowing them up. But the important thing is it's very good at putting multiple hull points worth of damage onto things because it's got six shots. It's the longest range gun on the Leviathan, so... It's got 15 inch more effective range than a Melter Lance. So 24 compared to 9 against heavier targets. It is likely to get better though against future 4 plus targets in the future when we get things like maybe Tag Marta coming out that I've got more of those saves. Because right now it's only really good at blowing up vehicles. It's obviously not very good for shooting into Marines or anything like that because it's not got much AP and it can't instant death terminators. The only really good double gun loadout, in my opinion, uses these, and we'll talk about that later. Then we've got the Grav Flux Bombard. Now, I don't know what was going on when someone wrote the rules for this, and I read them so many times when I first come out looking for what I was missing. It's short range, and it doesn't leave a Grav template, unlike a Grav Gun. Now, that is one of the strongest things the Grav Gun does, is leave that dangerous and difficult terrain on the floor. Now, because you have to take your strength test on 2d6 when a Grav Flux Bombard hits you, it will wound most things, but it will almost never wound a Dreadnought, and it's only AP4. So the chances of actually killing anything with this are super, super low, much like a normal Grav Gun, but you know, if you're going to make this a bigger version, you would think it was better. I think in the original League Playtest rules, it was AP2, and it was actually pretty good at that point, but you know, that didn't last. 4d6 armor penetration it gets so instead of haywire you roll 4d6 for armor penetration it's actually worse than haywire most of the time so it doesn't wound dreadnoughts very well making it worse than just a grav gun with haywire 4d6 armor pen 
means that it's only going to glance a land raider on average, and average won't hurt a Spartan. And only a slightly below average roll will see you only glancing or not wounding a Predator. Now, Torsion Crusher does double the hull point damage, but that really doesn't make up for it when most of the time you don't actually hurt things. So it's lost everything that's good about a grav gun in return for getting some different cool sound and rules that actually make it worse. You know, this would have been fabulous if it was just a grav gun with a five inch blast. Maybe it did double haywire hits or something like that. Could have been a really good gun, not too powerful, different thing to take. But as it is, you should just leave this at home. It's just really poor. You're going to have your big, cool, awesome model just doing nothing when it shoots things. And even as a diehard Iron Hand Graviton fan, I'm not taking one of these because it's just not, you know, it's gameplay doesn't reflect its coolness that it should have on the tabletop. Some more weapons that we use on the Leviathan are double heavy flamers. So you get these for free. It's pretty good damage output if you're in range and really the Leviathan likes to be close. Good for barbecue and marines. Maybe marines are going to try and top it. You, you know, lock your dreadnought up in combat or something like that. Or it's just generally good for a bit of extra free damage output. Now, the alternative is the twin link Volkite Calibers. These give you six twin link shots at 30 inches, which means they're probably going to all hit because you're ballistic skill five. And that's a decent upgrade over the Heavy Flamers, but it's 15 points, which is really expensive for six Volkite shots. It's just really not very effective. You know, if these were five points, I would probably take them quite a lot of the time, but still not all the time. 15 is just a lot of points. And also as well, the Volkite Calibers are generally wanting to shoot a different target than what all the big guns on the Leviathan are wanting to shoot. So even if, you know, it, it was something that you were considering, a lot of the time it's the wrong target mix as well. So I don't think these are these are great, and I generally stay away from these. Although you can use them if you want to. They're not the worst thing in the world. They're just a few too many points. And then last but by no means least, we've got the Phosphex Discharger. So this is a very rare and powerful template weapon with AP2. Very hard to get these in the game. Nowadays, very good at killing a whole variety of targets. Leaves dangerous terrain on the floor. Just a really, really powerful weapon. 18-inch range, so quite short, but not that short. Doesn't always share optimal targets with the rest of your loadout, though, so you do have to decide when you're going to take one of these and when you're going to not. And if you are going to charge and have to fire it, what I've learned very quickly using one of these is that you can actually dangerous terrain yourself if you shoot this at a bunch of Terminators or something and then charge in. You can end up charging onto your own dangerous terrain. So bear that in mind when you're using it as well. But otherwise, very worthwhile upgrade as long as you've got the right weapon mix transport options so you can use a dreadnought drop off for 100 points now for a dropping a leviathan dreadnought 100 points is maybe not that bad because it's a very slow moving model and that's its biggest weakness so this mitigates the biggest weakness by just putting it straight in your opponent's back line potentially now it is a lot of points to spend if you end up playing someone who's going to run at you anyway you probably waste 100 points and depending on what interceptor your opponent's got in their army, it could be, you know, still get killed or lose most of its wounds when it drops. But against some armies, you know, not everyone's got lots of anti-tank interceptor. Lots of people have like Volkite and other stuff. And you may be able to just drop it in an area or against some armies where most of the interceptor isn't really going to hurt it because it's so tough. And, you know, if you can maybe suppress the bigger interceptor units like a 10-man las cannon, if you shoot that, in your turn before this drops or something this can be extremely strong i don't think it'll be that common just because it's so expensive and there is a you know a good chance of it going wrong for such a big model but it's definitely usable and if this is a kind of thing you th you think is cool dropping a dreadnought in i'd definitely do it similarly the charybdis you pay another 135 points effectively to get to assault the turn you land which is even more powerful but even more expensive so otherwise all the same stuff applies it looks very cool it's really great to do that but at that point you're to, it's over 500 points to get one dreadnought into your enemy's back line so that's probably more worthwhile if the rest of your army is doing it or if you just want to do it for fun reasons rather than because it's super effective for what it costs with all that said, let's have a look at the optimal loadout. So when I say optimal, what I mean are not necessarily the absolute best ones, but the ones that will get you, you know, good value for what you're doing. So the first is double storm cannon with heavy flamers. Very good at damaging and disabling vehicles at range, as I mentioned for the storm cannon before. So this is 12 shots with Rendon 5 plus and Sunder. That will almost kill Land Raider 
in one round of shooting on average with the with your ballistic skill of five. It'll do 4.8 glances. So rounding up a little bit, it will just glance a land raider to death. And of those, multiple of those will actually be penetrates, not glances as well. So even if you don't get the full five, you've got a good chance of knocking off some weapons, immobilizing it so it can't deliver its cargo or whatever. And this is why I say damaging or disabling. AP4 means it's often not going to blow things straight up, but you are going to knock a lot of hull points off and do a lot of other damage. Also, great versus Lords of War. You know, if you think you've got a 14 armor fell blade with 12 hit points and this is knocking five of them off whilst also blowing up some guns every turn that's not the greatest position to be in with your lord of war either similarly it'll do about three hit points to a spartan including one of those being a penetration so it can kill the spartan over two turns without many issues and also along the way get some penetrates which again if you're lucky could stop it from delivering its cargo or take out one of those big guns it will also absolutely shred an enemy vehicle squadron so if you do come up against something like two or three predators or vindicators or something like that this is also really good at dealing with those two less good at shooting at an individual enemy vehicle because you you are almost certainly going to kill a predator but it's just a much less attractive target for for what this does finally i think it looks amazing i've got one of these i've got two storm cannons and i just think two big giant sets of four machine guns just really look so good and at 290 points i think this is uh, pretty good for what it does if you want some fire support and we've got a Storm Cannon and Siege Claw with the Heavy Flamers as well. So that's 280 points. This is is good at just killing, you know, individual AV-13 vehicles. Obviously, it can shoot at the targets we just mentioned as well and knock a couple of hull points off them. But this is particularly good at just picking one smaller vehicle and blowing it up every turn. Very consistently blowing an armor value 13 vehicle up every turn, whilst also retaining most of its melee power. So if you're going to defend or attack with it with its claw, it can go forward. It can do most of what the Leviathan does whilst also popping off some vehicles at the same time. And again, these mixed weapon loadouts tend to look pretty cool. Okay, then onto the big one, the Cyclonic Melter with a Siege Claw and Heavy Flamers and optionally also the Phosphex Discharger. So this is a very flexible loadout. You know, it's good versus vehicles, obviously, if it gets into range. It's good versus Dreadnought because it's got the Cyclonic Melter and Phosphex Discharger in theory as well, you know, if it wounds, will go through the AP2. It's also good versus elite troops as well, because you've got multiple shots and the Phosphex on top of that as well to deal with things like Terminators or things in Artificer Armor. Not amazing against them if they've got uh, an invulnerable save, but you will kill multiple, which can very quickly make your points back on your Dreadnought. With Phosphex particularly, it's good at that. Now, I think the Melter Lance is good for just shooting into Terminators, when you, particularly because it's effective at doing that at 18 inches, where it's only really good at killing vehicles at 9. But if you've got Phosphex as well as the Melter, you can actually clean up a lot of troops, or even Marines. You know, if you're in range to shoot some Marines with expensive weapons like Plasma Guns, it's totally worth shooting them with something like this. The 310-point loadout is the one I've been playing the most for this. Now, that's mostly because I wanted to perform a sort of multi-role in my army but i do think it does it very well and we've also got the melee loadout so the box art loadout from the plastic leviathan dreadnought you can get now siege claw siege drill heavy flamers and i'd also be given this phosphex as well so that's 295 points and that's five base attacks uh, incidentally i don't think these get the bonus on the sheet and the double weapon bonus and different people think different things about that but i'm going to assume uh, we're going with my version for now so five base attacks and basically, you've got the weapon profiles to kill any target stands in your way. As I said before, with the weapons, it'll punch elites to death. It can also punch vehicles to death as well. If you really need to save five points, you could forego that siege drill and not bother and just let other things destroy vehicles. But it's a pretty good way to spend five points. What I like about putting the phosphex on this is because you haven't really got any arm weapons to, to waste if you had multiple targets, you can just make it good at shooting infantry so it's got the phosphex it's got the heavy flamers you can shoot some infantry you can be killing some stuff before you get into melee two ballistic skill five melter guns is still also very relevant close range firepower as well it's not something you want to be shot by and you know again it can also be turned on elite vehicles in a pinch and this looks the most badass of all this is badass squared i think double melee dreadnoughts just look the best especially with that phosphex launcher on top it looks like it's popping off grenades on its way in its strengths are that it's very hard to kill 
it can shoot at targets without worrying that they're going to return fire at it, for example. So, you know, you can shoot at things like javelins, which are not going to do a lot of damage back to you because you're so tough. Even though it's shooting you with effective weapons, you can still shoot at them without worrying too much about return fire, which other units couldn't say. And obviously some units, it just won't be able to do any damage or unlikely to do any damage to it at all. It's difficult for a lot of any armies to kill it at all without soaking up so much firepower they get put in a bad position you know if everything's shooting at this not shooting at your other stuff and so you get the most value out of it in a lot of ways when people do shoot it so if they're not shooting it it's actually you know being less effective it hits very hard in melee as well as i've just mentioned so it's weapon skill five it demolishes enemy characters and elites you know it instant deaths almost every inner hits it's brutal three it's really really tough and it's got Weapon skill 5, even against weapon skill 6 characters, you only get need to get one hit on a lot of weapon skill 6 characters and they're dead. So it's really good at countering those things as well, particularly if you're an army that doesn't have access to great melee units. And it's also got access to Phosphex as well. That Phosphex template is just so powerful. A template with AP2 is just a very powerful thing to have, very hard to come by. And that's also a strength of the unit is being able to bring something so scary into your army. Weaknesses though, it's expensive, so it can have a very low damage output for its points if it's not fighting optimal targets. You know, if all it gets to shoot is Space Marines, or if you stay out of range of it on multiple turns, which has happened to me before, you know, some turns of the game I've just not been able to shoot anything at all, it can actually have a very low damage output, and even when its guns are all fully enabled, a lot of the time they just don't do that much damage for 300 points. If you allow your opponent to play around its weapons and they don't shoot it and, you know, waste their guns on it either, it can be quite a very expensive brick that doesn't do a lot. And that's where Contemptors have a leg up on the Leviathan is that they're a lot cheaper, they're a little bit harder to ignore, and they're a bit faster as well to bring their guns to bear. It's very slow. So six inches, there's not a lot you can do about your opponent playing around this in a lot of situations, and particularly... You know, you will find that when it goes to charge something, it won't always be able to get right next to an enemy unit. It might just be like three or four inches away, which means that when they then react and withdraw, suddenly you've got very long charges to make, which is hard. And it's also cumbersome as well. It's got a very big base. So just getting on a decent board with decent terrain, or if your opponent's actively trying to block it with things like rhinos or units it doesn't want to go into melee with, it can actually be very easy to block and it can struggle to get where it's going because of that combined with a six inch move, which really does reduce the effectiveness that a lot of people perceive of this Dreadnought. Uh, it's short ranged, so most of its weapons want to be between nine and 18 inches away, depending on what they're shooting. And it's got these melter guns that it really wants to turn on as well, which are even shorter range. It's difficult to justify most of the two gun loadouts because it becomes too easy to tie up. So if you do take two cyclonic melter cannons, for example, it's just got to get so close for those to be good, at which point any melee unit can just charge it, and it's probably tied up for the rest of the game because it's got no melee weapons. It's got mixed weaponry as well, so although it's got lots of great weapons on it, it's difficult to maximise its output due to the you know the mix of range of melee and a difference in the preferred targets between something like the Melter Lance and the Phosphex weapons. You know, It's difficult to get all the value out of all of them at the same time. So although, again, it looked great on paper a lot of the time, you never actually quite get the value out of it for all the stuff you've paid for. So what roles can this fulfill in your army then? So all those loadouts we've talked about, all those weapons, what does it actually do on the tabletop? Well, offensively, you can use it to push enemies off objectives or control the battlefield by just advancing forwards. Now, the Leviathan is slow. So what it's not going to do is get to your opponents maybe further away stuff, and it's also not going to run around pushing your opponents off every objective but it can just deny objectives or space on the battlefield by being hard to kill, forcing your opponent to waste a lot of firepower to remove it if they want to get it off the table. Alternatively, they're just going to have to eat at short-range firepower. So that's really what it's for. It's it's a domination piece. Defensively, on, on the flip side, which is how I play my Leviathan personally, is it's what you call a backline for your firebase. So... If your opponent wants to come and get your squishy guns, you know, with their melee stuff or with their shorter range stuff, you know, try and enable their bolters to shoot your more powerful units, they're going to have to go through your Leviathan first. And that means that 
you know, you get around its slowness by forcing your enemy to come to you by having some guns. It contributes some firepower, depending on your loadout, while also being great in melee. You know, my army that I play has got a lot of shooting in, so I like to have the Dreadnoughts, which also contribute to the shooting, but mean that when someone does get close, I've got stuff to punch them back as well. It's generally good versus the types of unit that can give defensive armies trouble as well. So fast units, including things in Spartans or Land Raiders or, or very tough units like Terminators that can absorb a lot of fire or melee units, generally the Leviathan is good versus them. They struggle to kill it. It's really good at punching through and vulnerable saves on Terminators and that kind of stuff. So they're the kinds of roles it fulfills. And so that brings us on to how do you actually beat a Leviathan then? Well, using its slow speed and its difficulty navigating obstacles and its short range against it, all those weaknesses we just talked about, make it waste as many turns as you can shooting non-optimal targets. You're never going to stop it shooting at all. But if it doesn't fire at anything on some turns, it's a lot less effective. You can shoot it from out of range so it can't return fire at you, which is not hard to do because of the range of its weapons. So if you are going to shoot it, you use something like las cannons, it can never shoot back. Don't feed it juicy melee targets needlessly. So there is a time to attack it with melee stuff, but, you know, charging something nearby with a unit of your elites and then letting the Dreadnought counter charge into them and just kill them all is, is potentially a waste. So be careful you don't do that unless you're making an active decision to do so. Movement reactions are really good against these Dreadnoughts as well. So particularly when it's trying to get into melee or even when it's trying to get into melter range. So, you know, it's got a nine inch range to shoot enemy dreadnoughts with that armor bane turned on and they can just movement react away out of that range really good for mitigating its weapons and don't be afraid to run away from it either so moving away from it can really really mitigate what it can do and if it ends up chasing you particularly if you're a faster unit you know if this dreadnought moves towards you to try and chase you away from something you can just then move away, jump back in your rhino, drive somewhere else or whatever. You can really leave these out of position if the person who's using them is not careful. So don't be afraid to, you know, think of a plan over multiple turns that ends up with it being out of position and again, mitigating the effect that it can have on the battlefield. Toughness is its biggest strength, so don't waste shots on it unless you're going to commit enough firepower to kill it. It's very unlikely you're going to snap a small amount of firepower off and actually do something useful. 10 las cannons will do just under three wounds to it, so... It'll take a three turns to kill it, even if you roll slightly below average. Or two turns will take off most of its wounds, and something else can just maybe finish it. Ten armor bane melter guns, for reference, will do just over three wounds. So I haven't calculated that one across multiple turns, because likely, if you're going to jump them in, they're probably going to die before they get to shoot more than once. But it's good knowing how much damage you can do. And a single multi-melter, which you might find on a rhino or a javelin or something like that, will do just under half a wound on average. So you can, you know, figure out roughly how many shots you think you're going to need to kill it. You're probably going to do it over two turns most of the time and make sure that you are committing enough to actually kill it. Because what you don't want to do is spend all your shots on it on a turn, leave it on one wound, and then it gets another turn to kill more of your stuff and the rest of the enemy army is untouched. Rend is also generally just good against it due to ignoring its toughness advantage. So even a low strength weapon with Ren 5 or 6 in a good volume of attack is a good way to knock wounds off it, as with any Dreadnought, but particularly to get around the toughness 8 on the Leviathan. Characters in melee with good weapons can knock wounds off it easily as well, so you are going to have to buy some time for those characters to do that work, which means the Leviathan will be punching and probably killing something. So, you know, you've you got to take calculated risks when you're doing that and don't sacrifice too much to buy the character time for those attacks and it can be overwhelmed profitably in melee by larger elite melee units so if you take say like 10 fire drakes for example it is going to punch three of those fire drakes to death you are going to lose 150 points worth of fire drakes but then the other seven are going to kill it so if you are running death star units and that kind of thing you are still up in the trade if you do that and lots of uh, effective melee elites as long as they've got the right weapons for fighting it will still trade favorably you know even something like galvorbach which are not the best at killing these but if you've got a big unit of 10 of it they again they will kill this on average when they charge it so just make sure if you are going to charge it with some elite melee you put enough stuff into it to kill it so it's not getting multiple rounds of, of killing your stuff it also works much better if you can get it to fight unsupported so if it's fighting with another melee unit of its own which can you know, maybe contribute some attacks or contribute to the combat results or something like that, it's obviously going to go worse for you. So being able to isolate them, as with most melee units, 
is a good thing. So in summary, the Leviathan, it's got powerful strengths and also very pronounced weaknesses, which I think is, is really good. Uh, the roles it plays on the battlefield do seem very th thematic. You know, it's a siege dreadnought, it walks forward, it's close range, it takes lots of firepower, it takes lots to shift, but it's very dominant in its area. Leveraging its strengths, the things it's good at, does take good play. And I've played games with this where I've misplayed it and it's not done a lot. And I've played games where, where, I've, where I've played it well and it's been dominant. But utilizing its weaknesses against it also takes good play, which is great because it makes it, in my opinion, a really balanced unit. Although it might seem scary having that toughness eight, both players have the ability through their decisions to affect the way it works on the battlefield, which is exactly the type of unit that we need lots more of in Games Workshop Warhammer games, you know, units that aren't just a thing with lots of guns. It's a really, really interesting unit. Contemptors, for the people who are wondering, this topic comes up a lot, are generally better when comparing Dreadnought to Dreadnought. They're a lot cheaper, they're a bit faster, they've got longer range guns, they're not significantly less tough, particularly for their points. So yeah, Dreadnought to Dreadnought, they are still a lot better, but they don't really fulfill the same role, although they're both called the Dreadnought. They're very, very different units. But Leviathan's definitely less uh, of a problem than Contemptors if taken in multiples. And that's the end of the show. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have got any comments, please do leave them down below on YouTube. Thanks very much for listening, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.